Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Let me show you one more in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians. And I don't have time. I really wanted to do all of chapter 3 tonight, but I know better. There's no way we can do all of chapter 3 in one evening if I did just chapter 3, but to lead you to 4. So 3 is basically Paul saying, hey, the ministry of Moses was written and engraved on stones, and it's also called the ministry of death, and it's called the ministry of condemnation. Because if you feed on that which is written and engraved on stones, you'll never live. You'll just die because you'll die trying. How many of you realize that? If all you do is try, if, you, if, if Christianity for you is a system of trying to do the right thing, you're in trouble. Anybody figured that out yet? If you haven't, Amen. guess what? It's one of the next revelations you're going to have as you live this out. The more you try, the more you're going to realize you can't do it. Just, it's just impossible. There's no way I'm going to be able to live up to this standard because you just told me I have to live like Jesus. Even when we try to Christianize our Christian Judaism and we go, oh, you got to have the Ten Commandments, but you really got to live like Jesus. You go, well, forget that. I mean, how in the world am I going to pull that off? Well, that's why we need the gospel. We need someone to do this for us. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Look at that. If they can't see the good news, why can't they see it? Because their eyes are blinded and their minds are blinded. And who blinded it? The God of this age. What age? John said in 1 John 2, the darkness is passing away. Paul said in Ephesians 6, this present darkness, the darkness of this age, is the one thing we stand against. The reason why... 2 Corinthians 4 could release you from the veil is because Jesus died on the cross in the darkness. Christ could walk into your darkness because in the darkness is everything demanded of you. There's the law. And Jesus could walk into that darkness at Calvary and he could hang between heaven and earth. The Prince of Light, the Son of God, the light of the world, and he could face the darkness face to face. I want to land with this thought. I want to take you to two more scriptures. They're on the Old Testament this time. We work backwards for this reason. Because the longer that you come walking out in your fig leaves and hiding in your bushes, that's religion, by the way. That's you leaning into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the best you got. Hey, it's the best I can do. I hope it works. Here's, all, here's what I got this week, God. The more you do that, the more you believe you're separated from God. You're not separated from God, but the more you believe it. Because that's what your performance does. It just convinces you God's not happy with me. And how many of you realize when you get in that mindset, you interpret every bad thing as judgment from God? You ever been down that road? Didn't do really well this week. Found out. Might be losing my job. <laughs> That's God trying to teach me a lesson. That's God. God's going to win. God's going to win. I mean, if you act like I've been acting, this is what's going to happen to you. I can tell you, God's not happy. And this is what happens when you do stupid stuff. God might do this to you. And God might do that to you. And God, might, and God gets a bad name. And every, everything we do, we end up, God ended up becoming our enemy. And, and we're, we believe we're separated from God somehow. So what do we do with that theologically? We put God in the moments of our greatest distress. Wherever I'm having my biggest trouble, God's trying to teach me a lesson. Wherever I'm going through hell, God's standing back going, didn't have to be this way. If you'd have just paid your tithes, you wouldn't have that flat tire, but you're going to pay it somehow, bless God. Uh, if you wouldn't, if you would have just witnessed when I told you to witness, this wouldn't be happening to you. If you'd have just went to church, doors were open, where were you? Well, I guess now you can have time to go stand in the unemployment line because you're not going to have a job anymore because I'm not going to put up with that. And, and I know we don't think God sounds that way, but we sure do have God doing more in dark than we ever have God doing in light. And that's a product of us living in the dark long enough. Us living in the darkness of performance and we think God's in there with us. And how do I know that's Bible? Solomon builds a trillion dollar temple. In our money, it was a trillion dollars. It's covered in gold everywhere. 
And when he builds a room for the presence of God, it's the back of the temple called the most holy place. And he doesn't put a window and he doesn't put a candlestick and he doesn't put an open door because look at first Kings chapter eight, first Kings chapter eight, verse 12, Solomon spoke and said, the Lord said he would dwell in a dark cloud and I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. You know what he just dedicated before he said that? The most holy place. He put the Ark of the Covenant inside the most holy place and he pulled the curtain and it was pitch black in there. You ever thought about that? The most holy place was pitch black. There's not a candle in there. There's not a window in there. There's not a door in there. He put the Ark of the Covenant in the darkest room he could build. And he did it because he said, the Lord said he wanted to dwell in a dark place. This is Solomon's mentality. Where's God live? Smack dab in the middle of my hell. Wherever the darkest spot is, that's where God's got to be. Why? Because that's God. This is where you end up with God. When it's all about what you do. Now, where did Solomon get this? I think he got it from his dad. Psalms, chapter 18. This is a Psalm of David. In Psalms chapter 18, it starts off with the Lord being His rock and His strength and His fortress and His deliverer, but then things go bad. The pains of death surround Him. And David feels like it's all over with. And he writes this in verses 10 and 11. So God rode upon a cherub and He flew, and He flew upon the wings of the wind, and He made darkness His secret place. His canopy around Him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. This is a prayer that David has when things are going wrong. And do you know what he prays when things are going wrong? God must live in the dark because I can't find him. And he raised his son to believe that. So when Solomon builds the temple, he sticks the Ark of the Covenant in the darkest room he can find. And he goes, this is where God wants to live. So at Calvary, Jesus squares off with it. And as he hangs between heaven and earth, the sky grows black and the earth becomes dark in the face of the Son of Light. And Jesus comes out the other side. In John 19, he says, it is finished. And when he comes out of the tomb on resurrection morning, because the sun comes up on a new creation, the message that his Peter and Paul and John take into the new covenant is, God doesn't live in the dark. God is light. And the dark is passing away. And if you'll open your eyes to the light, you'll realize what you would have never figured out in the dark. He loves you. He's merciful over you. And you have forgiveness of sins. Come out of the darkness, won't you? Get out of the darkness of wallowing and hate and self-pity and judgment and condemnation and unforgiveness. Get out of the dark of what can I do for God so God will do for me. God doesn't live there. And for all of us that think He needs to, He walked into it at Calvary so that we don't have to live there. What He does on the other side of that darkness is He comes out of an empty tomb and He shines light into our earth. What do I mean by their darkness was an age that was passing away? I think they were waiting for the day that temple came down. They were waiting for it. Because if that temple can come down, then we're done with this animal sacrifice business. If we can just move it. Here, here was literally the New Testament writer's thoughts. If we could get to the other side of that temple where there was no more animal sacrifice, we'd be done with the law. Wouldn't that be great? We'd live in a world where no one was under legalism. <laughs> well, they weren't all wrong. We are in a world where we don't go offer lambs and sacrifices, but... I don't think they accounted for our propensity to be infatuated with the darkness. And I don't mean sin. I mean the place where we get to wallow in our own guilt. Where we get to go to work for God. They forgot that just give us a half an inch and we'll build another dark closet to go offer up a sacrifice to God in. Because we've got a pretty deep connection back to that tree. 
But I'm here to tell you, it's not you. And if you're stumbling around in the darkness of your own mind, your own religion, your own unforgiveness, your own guilt, your own shame, you are sons and daughters of the light. Live like it. Open your eyes and realize you are forgiven. You are royal priests. You are sons and daughters of God. Now go out there in the world. It's a dark place, but it has nothing on you because you walk out there fully equipped to live light in a dark world so that everywhere you walk into, light walks in with you. And that's good news, man.